This is Kilauea, one of Hawaii's most active volcanoes. In 2018, it erupted and destroyed around 700 homes and forced thousands to evacuate. Since then, a lava lake that had been boiling at the volcano summit has been replaced with something exceedingly rare, water. So how did all this happen? And what does this all mean for Hawaiians living near the volcano? To learn more, we spoke with a scientist at the USGS. My name is Don Swanson. I'm a geologist with the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory of the US Geological Survey. I'm retired, but I've been working on volcanoes for my entire career. So most of us have heard of Kilauea, but maybe walk us through some basics about the volcano and what has been happening in the past month or so. Well, it was erupting almost continuously for decades until last summer when a, a barrier that had been keeping magma from getting beyond that point failed somehow. And so magma was then able to travel down the rift zone and the largest lava flow during recorded history was erupted farther away from the summit, uh, destroying more than 700 homes and creating a lot of havoc. The lava lake at the summit, which had been present for 10 years, began to drop down very rapidly. And eventually, the entire summit collapsed, or the caldera collapsed up to 500 meters, a little more, and was quite uh, quiet until July 25th when we, we saw the first visual change at the volcano uh, in a year, and that was the appearance of this uh, green uh, water pond in the bottom of the crater. And that's the interest uh, that we currently have. So do we have a good idea yet whether this is water that is just kind of rainfall sitting at the surface, or whether this is water that may be bubbling up from deeper in the ground? That's a really good question, and we don't know the definite answer for that yet. But what we think it is, is water that is slowly infilling from below, rising up into the low part in the crater. There still remains a possibility that it's a rainfall that is directly feeding the pond. But we don't think that's true because the rate of rise of the pond, the rate of growth, has been pretty steady slow and steady now since it was first recognized. And that's more consistent with slowly rising water table than with rainfall. So if it were just water sitting on top from the rain, but uh, perhaps more likely if it is bubbling up from below, how would the implications be different for maybe future eruptions of the volcano? Well, if there's just a puddle of water on the surface, then any future eruption probably wouldn't uh, be affected by the water uh, at all. It, it would you know, just be so small. But the problem comes in if the uh, water is deep, much deeper than just on, uh, that we can see, but going down maybe several tens of meters uh, into the hot conduit uh, that feeds magma, then there are two possibilities. If magma rises very slowly up through the water, it's simply going to evaporate the water and erupt as a lava flow. And, and that's, that's the kind, normal kind of eruption at uh, Kilauea. But the problem comes in if the magma is rising very rapidly, like it's starting one of these big fire fountains that are so famous uh, in Hawaii. If the magma is rising very rapidly, already starting to form a fountain, and then it encounters water, then it transfers heat to the water very quickly. The water boils, generates steam, which helps to power the eruption, and then we can have a real explosion. Uh, manufactured by uh, both the gas that's uh, in the magma and the steam that's derived from the heated groundwater. So it, it, in order to get an explosion like that, we need to have really thick water body, uh, several tens of meters probably, uh, and rapidly rising magma. But we're pretty sure that such eruptions have happened in the past. We find evidence for that. But we don't think that they would be nearly as large as some big boom, you know, that's, that's going to uh, affect people in distant areas. This would be something that would likely be confined to the summit of the volcano and uh, only a portion of the summit, uh, in fact. So explosion, possibility, big explosion, probably not. Walk us through what we're looking at here as far as the geology is concerned and how that might play into the way that this water is forming. This all has to do with the level that the water table is at Kilauea. Below the water table, rocks are saturated with water because they're quite permeable. They have fractures running through them. We know from measurements, direct measurements, that the water table is at an elevation that's about 70 meters higher 
than the bottom of the crater where the pond is starting to form. So there's quite a head there. And so we think that the water is, is rising back up into the crater after having been uh, displaced during the collapse last summer. In theory, this level could continue to rise up another 70 meters or so to the level of the water table that we've been measuring. Whether it will ever reach that height is, of course, we don't know. So there are easier sciences to do in this world than studying volcanoes. Can you walk us through how you go about studying the volcano from here while still staying safe? We're able to remotely watch what's happening from webcams that have been installed on the rim of the caldera. We can also go to the rim and make visual observations, which we do on a daily basis now, and make make measurements to the uh, surface of the pond using a laser rangefinder. I take a lot of photographs and videos and so forth. And one of the most important things that we can do now is to get a sample of the water in that pond. Now that isn't the easiest thing in the world to do. We're considering two different options. One, uh, dangling a, a bucket from a long, long line from a helicopter or using a drone to get the sample. But if we, if we can get a water sample, then we will be able to tell a lot about the chemistry of the gases that is coming up through the water. And also we'll be able to date the water. And this can tell us whether the water is coming from groundwater, as we think it is, or if it's coming directly from rainwater that's falling into the crater. So this is the most important item on our agenda now. That we, we just hope that we can get permission from the National Park to do this sampling. This is you know, fundamentally a different kind of volcano than what you'd see more explosive types like Mount St. Helens. The people of Hawaii are not in danger of a, a catastrophic explosion, um, but there's something unique going on here. For the last 2,500 years, Kilauea has been in an explosive mode more than half the time, believe it or not. But we've been lulled into thinking that it's just kind of a docile volcano because the last 200 years since researchers have been here, uh, it's, it's been acting that way. But at some point in the future, maybe the near future, it will return to an explosive phase. But these explosions are not in general as large as at Mount St. Helens or at other big explosive volcanoes. They're smaller because the magma is less viscous, more fluid, and doesn't have as much gas in it. And also, at Kilauea, everything that's happening is, is deep in a hole in the volcano, and large populations don't live right adjacent to the summit of the volcano where the explosions occur. Now, there are people living there, don't get me wrong. There are a few thousand people there, but it's not like in Auckland, New Zealand, or someplace where you can have higher populations at risk. And also, the wind here for big explosions the ash can get up into the jet stream, and the jet stream typically blows toward the east and the southeast, which is a very sparsely populated part of the island. So for all those reasons, although Kilauea erupts frequently, and in fact I've called Kilauea an explosive volcano, its explosions are not as large and probably will not have as much impact on society as would something like Mount St. Helens. How might this volcano, what's happening right now to the volcano, um, help scientists figure out know more about this specific volcano, but also apply those findings perhaps to other volcanoes around the world. The generalization is always imperfect because each volcano is a bit different, but we will watch the rate of rise of the water in, in the crater, and, and that will be something that's probably never been done before. What, sort of watch the birth of a water lake in a caldera from probably the groundwater, not from rainfall. And, uh, and then, if, if whatever happens next uh, regarding an eruption, we'll be able to observe and evaluate what impact, if any, the water had on that eruption. And that will certainly be of great interest to volcanoes around the world that have water associated with them. Even though comparatively little is happening now at Kilauea, it's still an exceedingly exciting time to be at the volcano because there's so much uncertainty as to what might happen. Following last summer's uh, events, we really don't know how the volcano is going to recover now. If it's going to return to the way it was before last summer, and I, I think most people sort of assume that's going to happen, or is it going to revert into a period of more explosive activity like we know this has happened in the past after there's been a cold era collapse? That's sort of my, my feeling. 
Are we going to return to the way it was in the near past, or are we going to return to the way it was in the far past? That's the big question. Thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome.